But ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another photo mishmash. This one being broadcast live March 17th. Happy St. Patrick's Day. If that's your thing, I did go find some green in the closet just so people wouldn't give me a bunch of crap. Um, I remember in high school getting pinched a lot if you forgot green, but um, great show. We have a lot of fun stuff to talk about that new super resolution mode in Photoshop. Honestly, I thought maybe it was just kind of a gimmick at first. I've done some early testing on it and uh, it's impressive. And there's enough photographers that I respect that are talking impressive stuff about it. So let's show you how it works and when you might want to use it and when it's not going to be good. We also, of course, are going to be reviewing your Lightroom photos. I have to talk about my embarrassing drone crash. I mean, I knew I'd probably have one before I sent it back to DJI. Um, the good news is the drone is completely fine. Good. Um, even the propellers, which is kind of amazing to me. So we'll talk about that. I might even be able to show a little footage of that crash, embarrassing as it was. Mostly because I had to wait for somebody to let me in to retrieve it. which So it got crashed in a place that I wasn't able to just go get it. Um, and, uh, we're going to review your Lightroom photos if I didn't already say that. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So today I'm very happy to welcome back to the show, Tanya Wilhelm. Tanya, how are you? I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I've been busy. Good. <laughs> Good. Yes. If, if you don't follow Tanya now, you should. Um, you are a fantastic artist, portrait photographer, macro photographer. Uh, through your one Instagram we have linked there, you can find all of those other Instagrams and kind of your social media handles. But you have been restoring furniture um, beautifully lately. So you want to tell us a bit about that? Well, I have a little bit of a life change going on and uh, I've been reclaiming a ton of old furniture. Essentially, if it's free on Facebook, I picked it up and then fixed it. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, yeah. actually my favorite piece I'm just about finished with. So I'm going to post that in my story soon. But uh, nice. Awesome. I'm very excited. I, I, I've been impressed because it's certainly one of those things. Chris is fairly handy um, and, and has made some beautiful furniture and, and kind of refurbished some. But I feel like it's one of those things where I'm always like, oh, that'd be so cool to do. And I might go pick up some free stuff now and then, but then like I'm looking at this dresser sitting over here that now stores our tools and is still the same ugly color when we picked it up <laughs> off the curb. So yeah. Um, yeah. it's been impressive. So I've really enjoyed watching that. Thanks. Well, yeah, it, it's too. been fun. It wears me out some days because I'm very gung ho. Like I bring it home and the prep work is the hardest part. Mm. And, and there's always a point where you're like, everything just goes wrong. Like nothing fits together. And I end up in like some major reconstruction that I had not foreseen, but, <laughs> but it yeah. has been very rewarding. Well, nice. Good. That's, Good. That's exciting. Yeah. And we're welcoming back to the show, David Carr. David, how are you doing today? I'm good. I have, I also have been very busy uh, with not as much photography stuff as I want to be, but uh, busy, busy as 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 much as I can be, and um, not restoring furniture. Although I would <laughs> like to do that, I, I really love doing that kind of stuff as well, Tanya. Yeah, so, you're handy. Well, yeah. I mean, I love. I, I guess not so much restoring furniture because I've done some of that, but um, building things like that, and I, I love the idea of restoring it. But you're right; it's so tedious and it takes so much energy. I think if I had a great workshop to really, really dedicate to that, I probably would do more of it, you know, but uh, I'm not quite. It would have been nice to have a workshop the past couple of weeks. <laughs> I mean, you don't have a workshop for it? <laughs> not for this. this is, just I've just essentially been destroying a room. <laughs> well, it looks great what you've done. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It would and be nice to go David. back to photography, okay. though. <laughs> I'm excited. Well, David Carr is a, is, a, is a fantastic uh, portrait photographer as well, wedding photographer um, in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Um, and uh, you can follow him on his Instagrams. And uh, I'm really glad you're on the show today because we, we didn't get a chance to talk about NFT, non-fungible mm -hmm. tokens, last right. week. We're not really going to talk a whole lot about it other than to say, you know, right after the show, the New York Times wrote up a big article about Beeple. I've never heard, I hadn't heard of that artist before that, before he sold a 69 million digital art collage thing. Um, yeah. And now it's like the second most expensive photo based um, art that's ever sold. But David, I'm, I'm curious because you're working in an art gallery now. And yeah. I want to talk a little bit later in the show about kind of the exclusivity and signed art and limited edition, because yeah. a lot of this NFT idea plays into that. So we'll, we'll chat about that. A little yeah. Bit. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I, I I've been thinking about it a good bit lately. So. Yeah. 
Nice. Yeah. And chat room. Welcome to the chat room. Those of you watching us live, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, hang out with us. You make the show better because you ask questions. You say interesting things like Teresa has already chimed in about how uh, the super resolution or the enhanced detail uh, feature has worked for her, not in a panorama, but in the individual images she fed into a panorama. So we'll talk more about that when we get to that part. If you're watching live and you haven't already, I'd love a thumbs up. That's a really nice way to say to other people, yeah, this show is worth your time. So thanks. <laughs> and if you're watching this and you're in the chat room and you're not a pen member, that's something you should consider. Photorec.tv slash pen is the easiest way to learn more. It is a fantastic community full of educational resources all about photography, not just photography, but the business side of things, which personally, as a person running my own business, I really don't love that side of things. So anytime I can get education from somebody else to help streamline what I'm doing and making sure that I'm putting my energies in the right places um, is great. So we have all of that information there, of course, with photography, Photoshop, Lightroom, Photoshop and Lightroom alternatives as well. David did his uh, excellent introduction to DxO a while back and some other options are on there as well. So check that out, photorec.tv slash pen. I'm running my own banners today because my, my son is on vacation and mm. he's been the person behind the scenes lately that was doing a good job usually. So, yeah. Okay. That was the chit chat. Um, oh, well, a couple of things that are exciting is is I do have on the table here my Alpha One. Oh, that's right. I you got it. Am very happy. There's nothing that I'm unhappy with right now. It really, I'm really excited to head to Africa in a yes. few days uh, with with this camera. Jealous. I know. Yes. I <laughs> I feel very lucky to be going back to Africa. I feel very lucky to be able to take this this camera um, and I'm excited about it. I also uh, have on loan the Ninja Atomos for the Atomos Ninjas, the way I should say this. So I'm really excited to capture some um, of the photography I'm doing where you can see everything that you would see through the eyepiece. So where is the focus oh, point good. hitting? Yeah. Um, is it registering IAF on elephants? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I switch to the bird, is it is it is it on on the birds? Because I've right. hear I hear it's hit or miss. Definitely some birds, it's IAF is working. Uh, some birds, not so much. Um, but one other thing that I'll say about this real quick is it has 8K video, which everybody's like, well, 8K. I don't even have an 8K TV. It's the same as shooting at a higher resolution than we often publish our photos out at. It gives you room and post to crop. I've been shooting most of the last bits of the review of the drone in 8K, and I don't have to worry about framing so much. That's I, awesome. After the fact, I crop in a little bit here or there. So easy. I can even add a little bit of kind of dynamic motion. If you watch the very beginning of the drone video, which will be out in a couple of days, I just slowly zoom in as I'm talking just to add a little bit more interest. And it's just it looks great. And That's awesome. to tie that all in, the 8K footage, I can't even get it. This, I can't get it in the screen. It plays back smoothly on my M1 MacBook Air. So amazing. I'm happy. That's awesome. I'm happy. Yep. So. It's, been a, it's been a good year for you so far, Toby. It has. M, M1 <laughs> Mac. I know. Chris, Chris was like, wait a second. How much have you spent? I said, it's all the business, honey. Yeah, it's, it's just all the business. business. I know. That uh, Porsche I bought last week, that's a business. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Uh, yeah. I did. My accountant has like wrapped up 2020 and according to them, I've made very little money. I was like, <laughs> I don't know if that's right. But then I look at what I bought because actually the MacBook, I think I technically bought it right at the end of the 2020. I think you it, did. I think yeah. I remember you like ordered yeah. it or something then or something. Yeah. 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 Well, that's awesome. So I mean, I'm very excited for you with that camera. And I can't wait to see it in, in action. Um, yeah. Exactly. That'll be awesome. That's, that's nice. And I think I said this, you know, last week, but um, I, I would not consider something like the D5 or D6 or the Canon 1DX series because as primarily now a travel photographer, I really do value that smaller size. And so being able to fit just about all of that, and maybe even a little bit more as far as power and autofocus speed goes mm -hmm. into a body that is basically the same size as my existing Sony a7R 3 I'm happy. That's I'm awesome. Happy. Yeah. Is there, a, is there a battery grip for that? I'm curious. Uh, there is... Not at the moment, but I believe there's one coming. Or I would might imagine. I would imagine because yes. th to me, that's the main feature of one of like the five, the the, the D five or the one DX that, that 
that's one of the main features is that you've got the vertical battery grip, battery grip built yeah. in, which I could see for some Sony users, that would be a nice add on, you know, if, if you're doing sports shooting or things where you like to be in vertical mode a little bit. Um, but that, I think it's a, it sounds like just such a fantastic camera. I'm, I'm super happy for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I do, I want to point out, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week on the Nikon D6, um, you know, the, the Z9 mirrorless that's coming. We've just got that picture of the front and it is larger and, yeah. and some people do like that. Yeah. Um, and, and there is certainly value in having that integrated control for portrait orientation too. Yeah. Um, but I'm just saying, I'm happy that this isn't any bigger. And as I carefully start to weigh my bag, um, yeah. because we have strict in-country flight weight limits in Tanzania, yeah. I'm, I'm happy that yeah, this is it, what I got. It sounds like the sweet spot. It's perfect. That's so, awesome. But, you know, to bring along the batteries for the Atomos, I am going to be leaving, like, most of my underwear behind. So, Car, you and I are instructors. <laughs> we'll be in different vehicles, so you won't have to worry about my stench. Okay, cool. But, that um, sounds good, man. Anybody um, who might be riding in my safari vehicle, I'll just give you a heads up. Uh, Toby gets his own safari vehicle. On. <laughs> yes. I will say when like, I got the Z7, I was almost disappointed at how light it was because uh, yeah? I was so used. But now I wouldn't want the heavier camera again. Yeah. So it's it careful what you wish for. It's, I know. I mean, having had a, a larger camera, I, there were times that I loved that. It, it felt substantial. Yeah. It felt like it really meant business. But then, yeah, you I couldn't even fit it in some of the camera bags. Uh, it, it was so tall that it, <laughs> like you couldn't zip the bag up comfortably without kind of like scrunching it. And it just so, yeah, it, it limited me in that way. So I think the Z9, it looks like it may be a hair smaller than a than a typical full size uh, like Nikon or, or a Canon. But I don't know. Maybe not. Um, so I think yeah. Sony did a great thing with that, making an incredibly robust yeah. camera that's still got a small profile. I agree. Yeah. Travis actually says he uses his uh, A7R4, A A92 grip on his A1. I are similar enough. I'm actually using an L bracket for the yeah. A7R3, and it feels a little funny here, but it otherwise fits fairly nicely. And okay, nice. This is how yeah. I'm going to mount the um, the monitor. So I'm glad that it fits well enough for now, but I will get one that's that's sitted for it. Cool. Yeah, and Pam says she loves her Z6 weight. Also, Roy is in the chat. He'll be collecting any questions. If you have questions as we're going, we'll probably answer them. But if we don't, Roy will be collecting them and we'll do a little rapid fire answer at the end of the show. Okay. Uh, let's dive into Lightroom. And just a reminder, if you're a pen member, you get to submit images to us. We give you a little bit of feedback on them and teach you some tips and tricks in Lightroom. It's just one of the many ways that you can get feedback on images if you're part of the pen community. Uh, we've got enough that uh, we, you know, we have to keep it kind of moving along because uh, uh, we got enough of them. So I'll just keep that. Uh, I'll just put that out to you. That's some of the super resolution stuff that we'll get to soon. But let's switch over here to our weekly mishmash crit and go there. And we'll do full, full screen. Uh -huh. There we go. Well, David Carr can't dress up. That's well, true. We oh, have that's right. That's I was going to put on my I, I was going to put on my leprechaun outfit while we were doing this, but I <laughs> can't find it. <sighs> was that? Oh, I, it ran off. Was that? Was that last week or is that? That was a couple weeks ago. It was now. the last time I was on. That's all I know. Okay. okay. <laughs> I got, so yeah. if you're watching and you don't know what David Carr is talking about, all I'll say is he answered what would the fox say, and um, it was <laughs> a couple not weeks a ago. Cat. So I know. go go look, go, look. <laughs> go back and watch it. <laughs> all right. Uh, first up, we've got Tom Boggs, and let's see here. I think he submitted three. Uh, he's got a DNG, so we can see his edits. He's got his JPEG, which looks exactly like the DNG, but is not editable, and then. Uh, Kind of the original straight out of camera. So let's mm. go back to the D and G that he's done some work to, and that we could do some uh, additional work to. Everybody always asks, uh, you know, what's the what's our preferred way for getting images? A D and G to me is my preferred way because we see your edits, but then we still have complete editing control over them. But JPEG or RAW straight out of camera is fine too. Mm. Um, at first glance, I, this is very nice, Tom. Yes, it is. I agree. So a couple of things that, that I like and notice right away is I feel like we have, you've gone to a black and white, which has simplified this. It lets us see both the texture of the bark. And I feel like really notice these rays of light and you've done some further editing to just kind of enhance those a bit. 
I like that. I look over at the histogram and I see that we've got kind of a, a good spread. Um, nothing that's too dark. Well, actually I hit the J and we have a fair amount in the bark. But I think I'm okay with that. You guys okay with that? Should yeah, we? it feels, yeah. I mean, I you know, I'm seeing it smaller than you probably are, but it just doesn't feel like that's hurt hurting anything, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I will say I, there are times when I've I've looked at my own photos and thought, oh gosh, stuff is way too much in the shadow or it's, there's no information there. I've got to boost it up so you can see information. And I don't know that that's always true. I think it just matters if it if it's important information or if it's really going to serve the photo. But there are there are spaces within nature where it's so dark that you you don't see any detail anyway. And so mm -hmm. replicating that in a photograph doesn't seem to be uh, an unpardonable sin, in my opinion. It just you just always want to make sure that you're not losing most of you know the, the shadow spaces yeah yeah uh as you're talking i did a little crop there i came up from the bottom i felt like at a certain point nothing extra is happening down here i mean you could argue we have a little bit of a path but this darker shadow is is so i want to come up past that um but i'm i'm open for a discussion on that if you guys want but otherwise i mean i, I think of, this is can i see ahead, the Don? color can we see the color one again I kind of like the color, but it's missing the contrast of the black and white. It is missing the contrast. Well, let's see if we can put that back in for a minute and see if you still like it. Um, I'm inclined to brighten it just a little bit, a little mm -hmm. more contrast. I'd also like to warm it up just. A bit. Yep, I was going to say. I think one of the things I like about this in color is that it's still monochromatic, really. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And uh, yeah. that's sometimes so unusual for color that I really appreciate it in this one. I do like it as the black and white, but man, this is a solid choice for me. Yeah, it, it's, I agree. It's kind of like you could really process this well either way. Um, yeah. Because that, you know, seeing like the, the golden sunlight coming through the trees is such a beautiful scene. The fact that that exists in this is what makes this work because otherwise it's, even if you're in the redwoods and it's, it was amazing when you were there, sometimes it's hard to capture that in a photograph. But by adding the element of the sun rays, it really brings it to life. And uh, so to me, color or black and white are very viable. But um, I, I'm kind of wondering if that tree on the right, which I love that that's there. I'm wondering if that was straightened out. Like, you know, you can you can stretch it. You can straighten it to be more parallel with the right side of the frame. I, I might just play with that, you know, in. in, in I'm yeah, glad you said go. that because I was thinking the same thing. But it's, it's I not, didn't know if I wanted to make Toby try and do it. <laughs> well, it's to me, it's not a total like faux pas. I just kind of, yeah. I'm always curious in those situations. I'm like, well, what would it look like if I did this? And then I might go, oh, it doesn't really seem to help or hurt. Um, but see, now it feels like there's not enough tree to me. So yeah, yeah, we could we could get a little. Well, no, we can't quite. And we could, we could adjust that a little bit more though. I th I think a, a little more of the standing. Um, I think coming up right a little bit more is good. Yeah, yeah. I, I think color too. I don't know if I haven't looked at the chat in a second or two. If if there is anyone uh, really kind of weighing in color versus black and white, so um, this is such a black. good example of what quality of light does to an image. Yeah, because mm -hmm. forest shots are really hard. I think because they can just be a a lot visually, but this the focal point is really just incredible light, and he did a great job capturing that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what I'd then, if you want to go color, uh, then I, I would kind of try to remove a little bit of the green tint from the trunks themselves. These are the redwoods and I try to get them back to be a little bit warmer in tone. Um, and that'd be a nice contrast against the green. But uh, I think you did a good job with the black and white or the color. Nice job. All right, let's move on. Steve Partridge has, oh, interesting. Okay. Oh, I want to do a lot of things with this picture. <laughs> like, All right. I want Tell to make top a three. composite. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. I like it a lot because mm -hmm. it's got a great vibe. The stage or platform that's coming out needs to go. But I also would like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm, I realize like most of the time when we're doing this, I try to just go with 
whatever the photographer was going with. I'm just going totally rogue creatively here, but I would take most of the people on the right hand side of this and put them behind the people. So it's just like a deep sea of robed. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so you people. do some Photoshop heavy lifting. I mean, that crop is cool too, but yeah, I would do just a lot because I, the one girl there that's near center, I just feel like she's the focal point and I just kind of want a fall off of robed people behind her. Mm -hmm. But that's a lot. That's a lot of changing. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I will I do point work out with Steve sometimes on some of his images yeah. for competition. So I think he's going to yeah. be okay with me saying all of that craziness. Yeah. No, no, I, I think so too. Um, <laughs> for some reason, if for some reason he didn't want to go that way, um, you know, I think you've got a cool start here. I will say, this is one of those examples. I know you were already at ISO 8000. So you were really trying to battle this theater light. But if you could have gone a little higher than F4, uh, because we have just some of the folks back yeah. just a little bit that start to get out of focus. And this might be, since Tanya already kind of broke the wall of, of suggesting some heavy editing, you might want to see if you can bring just those faces into Topaz mm -hmm. and bring a little bit of focus back to those as well. I, I, this this uh, young lady right here and her gaze and the way the shadow cuts across with just a hint of the eye, I love. I love yes. it. Um, so that's, that's well captured. Um, and, and you might also have, and this is kind of going with the Tanya's suggestion as well, you might have uh, alternate sh alternative shots that you captured where some of these other faces are more in focus because of where they were placed as during this performance, I'm going to say. Um, and you might be able to kind of swap them in. One of the nice things is even if you're not great with Photoshop because of this dark fall off and just out of focus darkness, you don't have to be too good at Photoshop to kind of plunk new faces into these. Uh, yeah, that's right. Moments. That's, you know, this is a good example too, folks, for like, you have all the elements here to do a lot of really fun things. If you're willing to, you know, not be a total purist and like move things around a little bit. And if you learn some of the skills in Photoshop, there's so many, there's such a cool thing happening here that sometimes you have to get pretty um, liberal about how you, how you edit, but you can do a lot with it. it. It's, it is, it has instant impact. It's impact. You just have to take it to the finish line, I think, um, to really see it through. Yeah. Yep. And I think you have some more room. I lowered shadows a little bit or the shadows or blacks. I actually can't remember now. I brought one of these two down and exposure and highlights up just a bit more. And I think, um, getting those faces to pop out just a bit more is cool. This is cool. Even if he doesn't go crazy weird with it, like I would, but mm -hmm. I like it. Yep, very nice. All right, we're gonna move on to Elizabeth Marlin Thompson's. Ooh, this is a uh, stormy sunrise. She's got a title of that, and this is for folks who don't know Tunnel View in Yosemite National Park. Uh, you yeah. have. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> uh, I had enough time. I could have muted the mic. Sorry about that. Um, All right. We have just a little of El Cap sticking out here, just mm -hmm. a hint of Bridal Veil Falls, and then hiding back there is actually Half Dome. So it's pretty neat um, that we have so much of this in here. Um, I wonder, though, about doing a crop that loses a little bit Mm -hmm. of this outer bit. Cause I don't know at a certain point, yes, we have that other hillside coming in, but I kind of like starting with El Cap just shrouded in a little bit of that cloud. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I'm curious, we're just working on a JPEG here. I'm curious if I bring in just a little dehaze mm -hmm. and I warm this up a bit somewhere in there. It's hard. The, the, the cold or the blue can give a sense of cold, but then I also kind of like the idea of maybe I'll just try the sky. Um, just a little bit of warmer sunlight starting to come into the valley. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. One thing I, I want to point out, it, it, it's a framing thing. And, um, you know, this this tree in the front yeah. is just grazing the, the edge of that cliff, uh, you know, and it it feels like 
you know, if you were there again and you could shoot it at a slightly different from a slightly different position and move that tree to another spot. Cause it feels like it's encroaching on that, that cliff to me. Um, yeah, I, if, if, I agree. Yeah. And it's, it's tricky. Sometimes nature is doing what nature is doing and you have to move or maybe you can't move, but I know where this was shot. And I think, uh, th there, there's probably a spot where you could slide over. You can't do it now. Obviously your the photo has been taken. So, you know, we're not here to like tell you, what you did wrong. It's just more like in the future might, you might want to think about just where things are placed. Cause, uh, pretty hard to move them after the fact. Yep. Yep. I agree. And the other thing that I did that I think this image has room for is I did a, just to brighten the Valley a bit. I feel like it still has kind of that, uh, sunrise feel to it still a little bit darker and, um, but brought up the texture and clarity too, to make those, those frosted trees down there in the Valley are just gorgeous. So I want to, X, um, kind of let people see that a little bit more. Nice, Elizabeth. Thanks. Okay, Steve Pressman submitted this, and I'm not quite sure what to make of it because hmm. uh, are were these bison all out there naturally, Steve? I don't remember seeing this, but you did some. Steve was just on our Yellowstone trip a couple of weeks ago, okay. um, and he did a couple of days of exploration on his own prior to us joining him. So maybe this is something he saw, but what I think is throwing me a little bit is, is our snow is so white that I have no sense of the kind of landscape that these guys are in. It almost looks like you cloned healed uh, and just threw down a bunch of little bison or maybe used a Photoshop brush called bison. And we're just like, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I don't have that brush. No, I don't either. So, Steve, and and because it's got a, we got a JPEG here, Steve. Um, I can't bring highlights down and and see anything up here. So, that's a bummer to me. Mm. I don't know. Did am I? Do you guys have that similar sense, or does it look to you like a bunch of bison out in a field, um, naturally? What do you think, Tanya? I it definitely has this. I feel like. I don't know. I was trying to look at the comments to see. I mean, he said it was before the trip and okay. Uh, okay. when shooting, oh, think, yeah. but it does have a feeling of cut and paste because we can't see. So yeah. like when I'm teaching composite work in my graphic design class, like I talk about how important the shadows are to kind of ground yeah. your composite mm -hmm. pieces. And it's, you're right. It's missing that in the snow. So that's why I think why it feels that way. Cause we don't see depth in the snow. Mm, yeah. That's um, a good point. But yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think I, I actually like the layout of, you know, the tree kind of off to the left and the, I, I like where the bison are. I think if we, it, it's hard. Cause I mean, and, and Steve is saying in the chat that, you know, this is natural. This is what he saw. And I don't doubt that for a second. It just, sometimes what we see gets captured in a way that almost can look more artificial. And so you have to like either dial it back in or shoot it differently um, assuming that we were able to give some depth to that, I would say there are a couple of bison that I think I would just completely remove altogether. And that's the ones that are sort of tangled up in the tree branches, um, because they don't serve, they, it gets busy around there. And I actually really yeah. like that tree against yeah, the, the tree. Cool. Yeah. So it gets distracting, even though I know that's what you saw. It just, it, it, it would, it would look more intentional if those weren't there. And, yeah. um, you know, and then maybe I would come down from the top or, or actually not come down, but there's some information in the top right that I feel like is, could be cloned out and just make, you know, yeah, make it white. Yeah. So and, I you think know, some... Tyson just learned to climb the tree. That's kind of what that one looks like. <laughs> That's he's what it is. Yeah. He's so, perched. So it's new <laughs> tree yeah, climbing they're, bison. Yeah. They're little bison ornaments. That's yeah. <laughs> And a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. I will say, yeah, I mean, uh, David Carr, your, your point, uh, similar to Elizabeth with uh, that pine tree kind of just really grazing the edge of the thing here. In this yeah. case, it would have been really nice to kind of step left or right and find a spot where we can give these bison a little bit of distance from the tree, if possible. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. Sometimes it's not. And so you're going to have to like, if you're really finishing it up for like, I'm going to hang this on the wall or sell it or something like then you you need to think of it as more like a painting that you're trying to complete to to get a, everything exactly where you want it and sometimes you have to sacrifice a bison or two but the good thing is it's all it's virtual sacrifice it's not yep. 
Yep. No, no, uh, yeah, no animals will be harmed in the Photoshop edit of this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Brian Scanlon's comment for a second. I, something like, Ooh, nice. you know, this. And yeah. if you get rid of just these guys and all of those guys, and I know that's a big part of the image and it changes a lot when you do that. But I think uh, less is more so often. Yeah, that's a uh, good that's suggestion, Brian. Something to think about. And then we really start to see the, you know, the trunks of this, the tree and all of those kind of cool branches as well. It's cool. Yeah. All right. We'll call it high key bison. Let's move on. <laughs> Pam's got this portrait. And again, I'm glad uh, both of you are on because you are uh, fantastic portrait photographers. And so Thank I you. love uh, Pam is looking for some tips and tricks on this portrait of her granddaughter here. Um, what do you got for her? Hmm. I would say at first glance, I think you could crop in closer because um, mm -hmm. you can see that she's in the snow and that's you don't need much more of it to see that. It's a portrait of her. And then I would say that skin tone is, is very important. And even though the light out there was cool because it was snow, you're going to want to warm that skin tone up a little and just make it look a little more. Yeah, just I don't know, just warm and um, yeah. The other problem in a, in a situation like this a lot of times is that the brightest thing in this image is the snow behind her. Mm -hmm. And you want the eyes to be drawn to her and not the bright snow. And there's a balancing act you have to perform between not losing too much of the brightness of the snow and making it look all silhouetted or, or vignetted, I should say. Um, mm -hmm. But you definitely want all eyes to go to her eyes and, and then move away. Am I right with that, Tanya? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think, and I like warming it up a little bit. And I think sometimes we're afraid to do that with snow, but um, especially the skin tones needed that. And this is a situation where even though I'm outside and there's enough light, I would probably use some like fill for the face. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, because you can brighten this and you can warm it up, but it's still flat lighting and uh, there, she could go in and Photoshop and contour. It takes, you know, some effort to make the lighting kind of uh, sculpted around the face, but the exposure in the snow is fantastic. Like kudos yeah. on that. Snow portraits are hard. You know, and I, one thing I'm thinking of here is that this is a, I think it's a great expression on her face and it's a, it's mm -hmm. a great pose. Um, I like that she's not just standing. A lot of times I think crouching, kneeling, sitting, somehow being more composed like that, a, a lot of times lends itself really well to a portrait. I like that you're shooting from above. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to say this. There are a lot of portraits that I take that start off like this, where it's it, it's not all there. Like, you know, and, and mm -hmm. Tanya, I'm sure it's the same for you. Like, yeah. um, I, I don't want anybody to think that like, we just get the light set up, push the button and it all looks amazing. Um, very often there's a lot of work that I have to do to kind of pull out everything that is, uh, that, that's, that's going to be there, everything that can make the image complete. And so, uh, you, it's like, you have the elements there to do that. I, I think so. I actually would crop this even tighter. I would mm -hmm. come would above the bottom knee because the snow in the background behind her has such great movement. I don't think we need the stuff in the bottom. Good point. And, uh, I don't mind a little bit on the sides, but I, I don't know if I would. I don't, no, I like that. That's good. I just think it, that you can come in tight on this. It's. I think a lot of times with portraits, we, especially if you're coming from a landscape background, are afraid to get close to the subject. Mm -hmm. And in portraiture, I'd, for the most part, that's the name of the game. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Nice. I think those are great suggestions. Thank you both. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, Teresa. It's got a beacon to all. Oh, nice. Oh, look, we have little, it, it, it didn't register right away, but I don't know if it's coming through or not. Hmm. We got a little bit of light rays. I don't know if you added those or those natural from the actual lighthouse, but uh, cool. Yeah, very cool. nice. Hmm. Do we have a very driftwood strewn beachfront? Hmm. Do you like it? Is it nice? What happens if we come up? We get too tight. I mean, I, I I think it would be nice to not have it, or maybe come right where the where the kind of red light is on the water, the kind of 
that, 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 that multicolored light coming across the water. Like if you come right to the, the tip of that piece of driftwood there. Yeah. You, you could easily remove that little bit of driftwood that's left um, yep. in Photoshop. And then you kind of clean this image up because you're starting with water and then moving into, I mean, I get it. Sometimes we yep. see the driftwood in front of us and we're like, Oh, I want to include that. And it's not wrong to include it, but you have to ask yourself, how busy do you want everything to be? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's exactly what I was going to say, actually. So I have no other, <laughs> I, yeah. cause I like the reflection in the water. So I, I would want to keep that, but yeah, I think that's a great compromise, David. And and you're right. You could you could take this out pretty easily. I know it's always tough. I think we we are out there and we, you know, part of the scene catches our eye. Like, you know, this is a cool driftwood. But then here it's just kind of busy and shadow and light play there it just um, takes me away from a very pretty powerful image that yeah. uh, becomes even more powerful when it's simple. Yeah. That I mean simplicity I'm finding more and more is is it works so well, you know, in, in, in so many images when you can simplify it down to the, the, the heart of what's really capturing your eye. Yep. Yep. And then uh, in these little navigation beacons out here, I'd take them out. Um, yeah. You know, they just, they're not adding anything. Um, and, and Teresa commented in the, in the chat, these were natural. So very cool. Yeah. Uh, Yep. And I like the, the cool, the cool night sky contrasted with a little bit of warmth in the clouds still. Nice. Yeah. Nicely definitely. Done. All right. Let's move on from uh, another nighttime shot. Brian Scanlon's lunar commute. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nicely done here, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Quite nice. I, the only thing that I could say, and I think, I don't know if this was setting sun or, or sorry, moon um, or rising, but just like the sun turns red near the horizon, the moon often does a bit too. And I don't know, it feels the pink, there's a pinkish hue to the moon. Uh, I don't love. Mm, I see what you're saying. Uh, but I don't know if I'm being too picky. So I'm just going to uh, put a little graduated filter over it, drop saturation a little bit. What happens when we bump texture and clarity and bring highlights down? Do we get a little bit more of the moon? Yeah. Yeah, you start to see some detail. Still, is it just me? Is it just my monitor? I feel like it is a good bit. It red feels a little pink, uh, red. I mean, yeah. it's it doesn't totally bother me because the bridge is red, so it kind of gives you that complimentary thing. But I'm with you that it that's not necessarily how the moon always looks when it's that close mm -hmm. to, the, to the horizon. Yeah. Hmm. But I mean, comment in chat, is this, is this real? Uh, I'm pretty sure Brian, this is, but uh, I think Brian's in chat to let us know if this is a composite. Um, but I think, I think you capture this framed really nicely. Yeah. 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 Uh, one other small, we have again, a little navigation or the, you know, the l one light up there, I these across are, you know, all part of a story. This one seems to be out. Oh no, that's some other pole. But that one being different near the edge, I'd yeah. clip that guy out. But yeah, otherwise, um, quite cool. Yeah. Very cool. Love it. Nice. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Chris has this one from our Yellowstone workshop we didn't get to last week. And uh, let's let's take off text for a minute. I think this is quite nice. Yeah, but I mean, we have, uh, you know, we're thinking about rule of thirds. I think there's a, a great story of Lone Tree out here and then a couple more. And then we curve around and boom, all of this forest and then these kind of uh, pinkish hued peaks. What happens, though, if we simplify something like, well, hmm, eh. <laughs> No, I, I, I know what you're doing, much. though. I mean, it, you, you got to mess around yeah. with it and see. Yeah. I wonder on. if you change the, the crop tool to the golden ratio, how that yes. falls on this. Because I think this is a really good composition, actually. How do I flip it? I don't know. But yes. I don't know either. But I think if it's flipped, that that, that tree falls right into the... Oh, so we, should we flip the image? Uh, Steve's not here. I don't know if we're allowed to flip images when Steve's not <laughs> I'll, here. I'm texting him right now. <laughs> Steve. We did it for his birthday. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, uh, that's right. 
Uh, that's right. Uh, every, if you haven't, wish Steve a happy birthday. It was, uh, what, two days ago now. So go go wish Steve a happy birthday. Um, yeah. Uh, that's not, he had a, he drank too much. That's why he's not here. He's been hung over for two days. <laughs> he had other reasons. Uh, but Tanya, I'm so glad you mentioned this because, you know, I rarely bring this overlay up. But when you're in the crop tool, hitting the O key cycles you through the different overlays. And one of them is this fun little uh, golden ratio, uh, golden spiral, um, that gives oh. you an idea. And so flipping that here is, is interesting. I think there's a way to flip the overlay as well, but I can't remember it. Gosh, you learn something new every day. I had no idea you could do that. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I don't, I don't really have anything else, um, to say about this image, maybe coming up a little bit like that. Yeah. Uh, I like the golden ratio because sometimes we, when we're composing, it's not quite rule of thirds and we're really, we're falling into the golden ratio without even trying it. And we aren't sure if we need to like actually get it like right on the crosshairs for that rule of thirds right. kind of composition. But this has, because of the great curve in this, like, I just think that works for this. Mm -hmm. I like the little tree down there. Yeah, I think you've done a nice job. Really nice. Maybe Definitely. paint a little bit more uh, clarity just on those the distant mountains over there. What did you paint here? You painted a little bit of um, contrast, whites and blacks, and dehaze there as well. Maybe paint a little bit. I would paint that same up on the mountains. I think you could make them pop a little bit more, but that's pretty minor. And this is a gorgeous shot, Chris. All right. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, Steve Pressman, we already talked about one, so we'll be brief with this one. It's a lovely shot. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice. Very nice. I, but let me ask you guys, well, there's our golden ratio. Um, let me ask you all, similar to Steve's other shot, we have no kind of detail in the snow back there. Does this bother you in this shot as well? Hmm. Not as much, but we have that shadow grounding him. Yeah. 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 But I wouldn't mind having more, but I feel like this one you can get away with it better. Yeah. Such a good expression. Yeah, it is. I yeah. it doesn't bother me a ton. Actually, did you just do something that brought more of it out in the foreground? I did. I brought highlights down a little bit again. Uh Steve likes to just give us JPEGs. He also likes to only shoot JPEGs, Steve. Okay. Uh, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine, Steve. Whatever. Steve, um, you're called out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yes, bringing highlights down. You know, I, again, I, Tanya, I agree with you. Um, I'm I'm less bothered in this shot with the yeah. loss of detail in the background um, because we have that grounding shadow. But I, I'd like to see a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, it's that it's always a um, yeah, matter of preference or or just. I guess it depends on the shot because sometimes like if, if this was just hanging on my wall, like as is, I, mm -hmm. I'd probably love it, you know? And, yeah. but, um, and I, and I, I say that because I know sometimes as a photographer, I, I think I have to like every, everything has to have some detail. As I was talking about earlier with the shadows, I've got to make sure there's some shadow, so, some detail in the shadows. Not always. Sometimes you need to step back and just, and, and kind of what, what does your gut tell you and just go with that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Roy I, just mentioned in the chat the shadow like by the head. Um, oh, I agree with I him. Lost I think, audio. Why? Why did I lose audio? I think that I would Sorry. remove that. Sorry, what did Roy mention in the chat? There's the shot, the one shadow by the head. Yeah, I would remove that. Okay. I feel like if you're gonna stay with this really high key, only a sliver of a shadow, that I would get rid of that one. All right, hang on, I gotta switch audio for a second, but I agree. All right. Anybody got any jokes? <laughs> Almost back. <laughs> I'm going to let you take that. <laughs> what did the leprechaun say to the Irishman? Good. Good going in. <laughs> oh, wait. Did it just switch back to the other things? Oh, that's frustrating. Hang on. I don't know what he said. Away. I'm still waiting for the punchline. <laughs> I'm really good at punchlines. I just don't know but, jokes. There we go. Okay. Uh, David Carr's out of jokes, so we're going to move on. <laughs> okay, I heard that. I heard that. All right, we do. We, we need to get. Uh, we need to get through these. These have been fantastic images, but we're going to power yeah, through here at the end. Yes. Um, we've got Jeremy Lavender's snow, mountains, clouds. 
Yeah. Love it. Yeah. We almost yeah, even see, seem like we have rain uh, or rain clouds with that kind of horizontal or vertical banding back yeah. there on those mountains. Yeah. It's, hmm. it's pretty well executed. I mean, I don't know. Maybe come in from the right a little. I don't know. It seems maybe like the right. Just that snow in the foreground maybe doesn't need to. Yeah, I don't know. That was the only thing I could yeah. muster up. Yeah, I will say this is probably harder for you guys to see coming over the uh, YouTube is I there's so much detail in this shot and everything is in focus except for this little narrow strip of snow here is a little bit softer. And and we're so close to having everything in focus. I'd like that to be sharp, too. Um, so this is at F13. You could have focused a little bit more in the foreground and probably gotten that, or this mm -hmm. might be one of those places to start to experiment with focus stacking a bit yeah. um, where you take a shot for the foreground and the background because there's such cool texture in these snow blown, snow covered trees and then the mountains as well off in the distance. Yeah. Yeah. And then, the, you know, we've got a couple of intersections with the far shore. So we're looking down on, on a river or a lake and this again is similar to some of the comments we've had on others. I think if you had been able to come up just a little bit higher so that we had a defined snow foreground, then that strip of river, or at least that far shore running unbroken almost all the way across, and then our kind of mountains and then our sky. I think that would have been um, a little bit simpler and a little bit stronger, but this mm. is still a, a, a nice image. It's cool. Very nice, Jeremy. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kelly has a street photography. So she messaged me uh, last week. She's she's trying to do a little street photography. She's recognizing it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so she caught this kind of fun shot and she wanted some thoughts on it. Hmm. I'm trying. What are those? So it looks like metal footprints kind of maybe art on yeah. a metal grate and it yeah. just happens oh, yeah. that a person is kind of walking so i'll say this i love that i think you waited and and captured a a moment that is kind of connected between random person and uh random street art so that's good but i do want to get past that time arrow sign yeah i was gonna say the arrow commands all of your attention unfortunately yeah yeah yeah, and that was a good so move. If we come in, we're we're definitely off balance here a bit. Any thoughts on that? Uh, it doesn't totally bother me. I mean, I think it's tough when you see a person, but you don't see the person. You just see part of, like, you see their their legs, or I mean, especially when you don't see their face. Um, it, it's not that it you always have to see the face, but you just then you're just gonna have to get more creative with what's in the frame and which is what you're doing there i think is is helping it it's simplifying it but still telling the exact same story as far as what what it is you know um mm -hmm. yeah. especially if you don't have a face to help tell the story then really simplify the elements yeah. I, i'm gonna say this i just like the way you are approaching street photography like i think that's hard to begin with and yeah. definitely you're looking for the right things um and if yeah. and I would have to say that she did, I'm going to guess she caught this as an actual moment because otherwise if I would assume if you posed it, they would line it up a little bit more perfectly. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is an actual like street capture and I just, good job. Yeah. 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 I don't Definitely. know. I think I think the blue of the color is neat. Uh, the black and white can work as well. I do wonder, you know, there's just even now the the lean is so significant. It almost feels like they're not walking, that they might be leaning against something other than that yeah. foot raised. So I'd love to see a, a shot. It doesn't have to line up with the steps, you know, kind of as as Tanya was was thinking uh, a pose shot would. But one that is just a little bit more upright is what I'd, I'd, I'd like to think about. But yeah, and I came, you know, I, I think everybody was watching, but I, I cropped in a little bit more. And so kind of tried to center it um, a bit uh, and got rid of some of that out of focus foreground. I don't yeah. think you need all of the footprints to tell the story, but just a couple of them. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Eric Anderson down in Tasmania has the shot. Oh, Tassie. Yeah. yeah. 
These are like my favorite colors. <laughs> okay, I really love this. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I love this silhouetted thing going on with these colors. Mm -hmm. I would come in from the left though. I don't think you need the dead space on the left. Cuz I feel like it's it, there's this striped effect going on that I love. Yes. So you went the complete opposite way that I would have, but oh, I yeah? feel sold on this now. Yeah. Well, I was going to say come in from the right and take out the the little trees. Oh, well, I could see that but too. Now that you said about the striped pattern, I think I like that better. Well, I was thinking about it. <laughs> well, thank you. I was thinking about it from like a squint test. Like if you if you saw yeah. this hanging on a wall, a piece of art from a no, distance, you're like, it's stripes. More graphic, yeah. Something yeah, about that. I'm sold on that. Yeah, I I I I, I like that you both um, saw different uh, at first. I, I think both are are very valid. I'm I am validating your opinions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> That's all they are is opinions. Yeah. So. I think on both sides there's interesting stories. Um, yeah. But I, I'm gonna settle on this for now. How how do we feel about this one tree stick coming in? Worth worth it taking out? Yeah, I would take it out. Yeah, yeah. I'd take it out for sure. And how about this this little guy, this little arm here? I'd take it out. Yeah, I think I because. Now that we cropped it the way David suggested, it's all about the vertical lines. Yeah. Yeah. That's the tricky thing. And you can, I mean, in Photoshop, you can do wonders to, you could get rid of all the leaves and everything and make it very clean, like very intentional, just tree trunks. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, but the cool thing I will say is that the elements were all there for this to be a great photo, no matter what you do with it, you have, mm -hmm. it's sharp. The colors are gorgeous. The silhouette is cool. It's just now it's just have fun with it. You know, you're not trying to yeah. fix something that you didn't do right or something. You know what I mean? It's like and sometimes nature grows in weird, weird ways and you either keep it or you, you you take it out. And so, yeah. Yeah. And I was just trying out Brian Scanlon's suggestion of coming down, simplifying yeah. it even more. And and as you've been watching us, probably with a lot of these edits, we have just simplified, simplified, simplified. I don't like this as much, though. I feel like I feel like the chaos of the grass because it's more prominent than Yeah, I, I see where he was going with it because definitely I like the clean the the cleanness of it, but mm -hmm. I like the tallness of the trees this way. Exactly. So, so I think you have to clean up you could get experimental and 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 you, it would take some work, but you could really make an incredible piece of art out of this. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, we're going to stop there for now. Kevin Walk, we'll get to yours uh, next show that we have. Um, you are a regular contributor, so uh, I know you'll be okay being patient there. <laughs> we're going to come um, back to, we're going to stay in Lightroom, but we're going to move on. Let's just jump right into the super resolution mode. First thing, I'm going to admit something embarrassing. I mean, uh, later on in the show, I'm going to talk about my embarrassing drone crash. We haven't even got to that. So, but I knew, so I knew this feature was now launched in Photoshop, this enhance feature that basically takes a image and uh, doubles its size. It's actually quadrupling its um, megapixels, but it's two times. So if you're like a 2000 by 2000 image, when you're done, you have a 4000 by 4000 image. Wow. Um, and uh, we'll look at exactly that in a minute. But here's what I, did. let's just take one of these. Let's take, um, oh, this is Elizabeth's. Right click and enhance details. When the new Lightroom came out yesterday, I was like, yes, they've put it in. And I clicked this and I was like, wait a sec, why, what's what? This hmm. enhanced details has been in here for like two years. And I I may have talked about it, but I, I don't remember. I've never and even seen that. I feel like I haven't either, but then I Googled it because <laughs> why isn't it working? And again, it's in the release date for like June, 2019 Lightroom. No way, like every now and then something like that pops up and I'm like, Here's the thing. It doesn't really do anything for most of us. If you're okay. watching and you're a Fuji shooter with their kind of X-Trans sensor, it actually can do a pretty significant job of increasing the details in the shot. Interesting. But for, and, and it will work on RAW. Let's, let's go to, um, who sent us just a pure RAW? Uh, Pam did. Let's see here. I think it should work on a CR2. Yeah. Okay. So it will work on this, uh, this shot. We can hit this enhance button and I think we'll get a second image that is enhanced here in a second. Um, but in my, so after I realized it's been around forever, I was like, well, let me try it. And, and it doesn't do much again, unless you're really kind of a Fuji shooter um, with those, uh, with that sensor. But 
So I, I thought they were kind of putting a pause on the Lightroom release because they were getting the super resolution mode in. They have said it's coming, but right now to get it to work, you have to be in Photoshop. Yeah, here's the here's the so the second. Let's see if we look at these side by side real quick and zoom in. Uh, the one on the the one on the right is the enhanced version. The one on the left is the original, and I'm not really seeing a difference. Yeah. Yeah. So Photoshop. Now, uh, if you, you know, if you're a regular Lightroom user, you know, you can right click and say edit in Photoshop. That's not how you get to enhance the super, uh, the super resolution mode, because you have to get into camera raw, but you can't get into it via the filter of camera raw. So ah, okay. this is what you got to do. I have a couple examples here in the Aurora dog sledding folder. Um, let's see here. There we go. So I've, I've already loaded up a couple of shots, but let me show you how it works. Here's the original. This was shot with the Sony a seven S three. I took that to Alaska cause I was really excited about all of the Aurora photography and the Sony a seven S three is only a 12 megapixel camera, but it does amazing in low light, but I also used it during the day some. So this resolution here is a 4,000 by 2000. Um, you know, if you, 2,800. This this works out to be about a 12 megapixel image. Um, so if you wanted to print it really large, uh, you know, it, and or if you did some cropping, but here's how you get to it. Right click on it and say, uh, actually, do you do it? Yeah, show in Finder. If you're a Windows user, say show in Explorer. Then you get to the raw file, right click the raw file, open with, uh, actually Photoshop doesn't show up for me for whatever reason, so I have to go to other and then Photoshop is listed right here. So I open it up. And now because it's a RAW and you've opened it in Photoshop, it goes directly to Camera Raw 13.2. So you have to have updated Photoshop this weekend. This is the very latest version. And now when you're in here, you right click and say enhance, which I love that they used enhance because it's from all those movies in Star Trek. It's like, you know, right? You got that. You got that shot. And then there's the reflection, and they're like, enhance, enhance, and then all of a sudden the license plate comes clear. Yeah. Right. <laughs> this isn't quite to that level, but if it was that easy. My it's God. getting there. Yeah, it's getting there. Brian points out that this is a broken workflow, Adobe, just broken. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Why can't we get this? And and maybe I might be doing something stupid. So. That's Before we write Adobe angry letters, but this was the only way I knew to get it because again, if you come into Photoshop from Lightroom and you use the camera raw filter, you don't get it. Hmm. So, all right, so we hit enhance. So what happens? We have the raw detail as an option. Um, I don't know why that's grayed out right now. And then we have super resolution. It tells you that it's going to be completed in seven seconds. Now you can open multiple images at once uh, through this. And you can even hold down, I think it's the option key, alt key on Windows, and it will skip this preview and just automatically do it. But mm -hmm. if I hit enhance, this 4200 by 2800 uh, image is going to become an 8400 by what uh, 28 is uh, 56. So it's going to become a significantly larger image. Now, for those who have been around for Photoshop for a while, well, of course, there's been in large images, you could make an image larger, but you lose a lot of detail. Usually that just kind of stretches and smushes the pixels. What this new system is doing is using artificial intelligence. They fed it millions and millions of images. It's using all of that information to guesstimate what the detail should look like in this shot. Hmm. And then here we go. It's done. It's got a second one. And we don't really see a difference. So we could just say done. And it's going to go back into that. Now, I've already put these side by side. So here is which one is the enhanced here. And here is the original. So again, uh, let me switch them as I said, there we go. Original on the left, enhanced on the right. Let's take away those tabs. You can see the dimensions 4,000 by 2,000, 8,000 by 5,000. So let's mm -hmm. zoom in on the sign. 
So we're at 189% on both of them. And of course, the one on the right, we are much closer because it's a higher resolution file now. And the sign looks great to me. Gosh. It looks fantastic. Yeah. Incredible. And so if we come over to this one and we bring it in so that it's about the same size, let's say we just increase that. That's too much. Somewhere right around there, I think. Let's let's make it so we can kind of see half and half. Um, the wood. Look at that wood texture. And look mm. at the crispness of the letters. Gosh, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. I have so, questions about this, but like... <laughs> Shoot, let's hear them. I might not have answers since I don't even know the workflow for I sure. I don't know that they're very intelligent questions, but I feel like if you ran Unsharp Mask on that first one, <laughs> would it get you close to what... I mean, I realize that it doesn't change the file size, but as far as the look... I know what you're asking, yeah. Like, it, I'm just trying to figure out a practical application for this, especially because, what, you can only do this to raw files? Uh, nope, you can do it to RAWs and J JPEGs. Okay, because uh, maybe if you're doing this from a cell phone image. Well, yes. so I, I have an image that I'm I'm really anxious to try this on. It's one of my favorite ones. It's it's uh, I've posted it before. It's it's uh, the four penguins. There's one jumping out of the water, and oh, yeah. the other the other three are looking. That is a heavily cropped image from a 20 megapixel camera. I mean, I, I and I was I was shooting at 500 millimeters. I was already as far in as I could get. And, but I loved what was going on. And I was like, well, I'm not going to just throw it away because I have to crop it. I had to crop it a lot. And I even went in and sharpened it. I found some online sharpening like tool that, that smoothed all the edges. So I got it usable. And I've seen it printed pretty large and it works. But this is an image I'd love to do this with is like double the size of it and then crop it and just see, see what I can get from it. Because there are times when you're, when you're in a place like Antarctica, you know, you don't want to. Yeah be like, well, I'll just get it next time. I'll bring a longer lens. You, you want to get what you can get. And sometimes you feel like you have to throw an image away that maybe there's a way to salvage it now. So I would be interested to do this with some macro shots that I cropped heavily on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I just see. can't see doing it frequently, but. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's that's exactly right, and, and both of you are hitting the important nail on the head. Um, I think this is this is about printing. So this yeah. is yeah. about printing. You've got a shot that you've either cropped, or it's an older shot that was taken on a lower megapixel camera, and you would like to print it large. That very likely this is going to allow you to do that, whereas you wouldn't have necessarily got those details. And I'm going to reserve full judgment until I've done some printing examples where I can, mm. you know, send off to and get like a 16 by 20 of a higher resolution versus the original. Um, or you could say, you could argue that this is an, Im this is for images you've heavily cropped, but then want to share out on social media yeah. uh, at a little bit of bigger resolution. You're not going to do this to all of your images. I think most of us are running around with cameras with plenty of megapixels yeah. um, most of the time. But when you have cropped or when you've got an older one, well, it fits into that sharpen, that topaz sharpen category where I'm not going to do that to every image, but there are some where I'm like, oh man, I missed focus on that face. And I really, this might just salvage it, you know, it might get me to a point where I can still share it. And yeah. that sometimes that's really priceless using the technology we have at our disposal to save our butts when we don't always nail the things yeah. we thought we were going to nail. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit of a, a peace of mind, you know, in the back pocket uh, as you're out there shooting of, you know, Oh, I, the, the way the longest lens I have for this example, or this bird or this owl that I've run across, I know that, you know, one of the things I might be able to do to it is this method of super resolution. Yeah. Uh, uh, first I want to address Tanya, your question of like, if you ran unsharp mask the thing, I've seen some examples of folks that have used both Photoshop's other tools to enlarge images. I haven't used, seen them use Unsharp Mask, but in those cases, it's not creating any new information. You know, right. it's only working with what it has and that's limited. But with this new method, it's actually being smart and creating details. I've also seen a couple of comments in here about AI, Topaz Gigapixel does the same thing. I tested it. I'm going to show you in just a second. I'll say ah. this. I love Topaz Denoise and Topaz Sharpen. I think they are fantastic products. I've been intrigued about Gigapixel for a while. We had a comment 
ages ago from someone who was like, you know, I'm really dealing with a lot of files. I'd love to shoot small. And then the special ones just run through Gigapixel. What do you think? And we were like, no, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> um, I mean, I understand where they're coming from, but I just don't want to ever rely on, at this yeah. point, I don't want to rely on the software. If if I need it, you know, great. Um, or well, yeah, because because there's nothing like yeah. nailing it in the camera and then just making minor tweaks. Like when you when you when you get a fantastic image, um, I, I would say that the one we just saw of Tasmania with the, the the color and the trees, like that was a really well shot image. It wasn't something you had to kind of salvage that was and sort of make it cool. Um, but sometimes all of us get those images where uh, it's not quite everything I thought it was going to be, but I might be able to make something uh, useful of it still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw Jamie put in the comments so I could carry a lighter lens and no, <laughs> like <laughs> what you said, that's, I mean, maybe if you're with a lighter lens and you need to push something, but I wouldn't, I would not personally want to use this as a back, like as the game plan, like this is a backup. Well, you know, just to use one quick analogy is like when, when I, when I build something or, or remodel a room or something, um, I try to get all the lines straight. I try to get all the boards straight. Every now and then I have to rely on caulk to fill in the places where the wall's a little bit warped or something. But the more I can nail it, like no pun intended, the more I can get the project right yeah. and all of that, the fewer times I have to use putty and caulk and stuff to fill it in. I'm glad I have those things, but I don't want to rely on them because it never looks as good as when you really, really do a precise job. And I think that's what we're ultimately we should be hoping for and going for. Yeah. Yep. That is true, but I will confess that my woodworking skills are essentially as good as my putty skills. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Baby steps. <laughs> Baby steps. I'm really good at that, though. <laughs> is, the, is the equivalent Photoshop skills to photography skills? You know. <laughs> that's and that's, I mean, you know, if you're going to have skills within parody, that's, those, yeah, those that's are right. great. Those are great. Yeah. I just uh, highlighted Mark's comment. This may work good for some of my old raw files from years and years ago. Exactly. I think yeah, this is something idea. powerful to to look at for some of those favorite images that you want to print large or share out that, that haven't quite been. Okay, so real quick, um, here is uh, Gigapixel's default settings. So there are a lot of settings in Gigapixel to tweak. I didn't tweak any of those because I'm just beginning to use it. Um, and on the right is the super resolution enhanced version from Photoshop. At first glance, they're not that different. So Gigapixel is doing just as good a job. I'll say that the, the win there is Photoshop because most of us already have Photoshop. So um, you don't need a separate uh, $80 to $100 program. If you look here at this little kind of these thorny branches down here, I think that they're much cleaner and sharper in the enhanced version. Um, yeah. Uh, there. But then, you know, when I first loaded it up and I got up here into the the sign, I don't see a huge difference up there. Right. Um, pretty, pretty similar. So, you know, I think if you already have Topaz and if you're good with it, I bet you might even in some cases be able to eke out a little bit better. It, it's, it's basically doing the same thing. Uh, you know, all of Topaz products have that AI after them because they've done a similar thing. Uh, but I, I'm excited for this to be in Photoshop again for some of those older images and, and yeah. to kind of have that in our back pocket when we, uh, when we need it, we need it. Okay. Any other questions about that before we move on? I think that's all I wanted to say. I showed the workflow. I will, I hope before I leave, um, on this trip to get out a little kind of step-by-step -step workflow, um, that we roughly just showed, but for pen members. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I might get it recorded, but might not actually release it just yet. So, um, Real quick, Sony announced the 50 F1 II lens, which um, it looks beautiful. I haven't reviewed that lens yet, but the reviewers I trust that have had their hands on it have very, very positive things to say. Really, the only negative thing is if you're a video shooter, um, it does do some breathing. So it's focal distance looks like it changes some as you focus, mm -hmm. uh, which for video folks, that can be kind of annoying. Uh, the only other downside is it is two grand, but that's actually cheaper than Canon's 50 millimeter mm, yeah. one, two. 
It's cheaper than Nikon's too. I think. I think there's a twenty two hundred. Yes. Or something. Yes. If you watch the camera store review, guys, uh, Chris and Jordan, Chris uh, is quite funny in that because he uses the weight of the Nikon fifty to compare because that fifty one two from Nikon. Do you do you own that lens, David? No, I okay. I haven't seen a need at this point. But. Yeah. Um, it is, it is a heavy, heavy lens. And I think the Sony and the Canon both are lighter. The Sony is even a little bit lighter. What yeah. once, you know, one significance of this lens is that there have been some people that have said that Sony has the smallest full frame mount of any of the mirrorless manufacturers right now. And some people have pointed that as a weakness, um, and a reason why Canon or Sony doesn't really have any F12 lenses. So I think Sony's very happy to say, here you go. Here's a stellar F1.2 lens cool. um, that uh, is fine. So, you know, you don't need to be worried about that if you even were. It's, it's kind of one of those things that people pick on here or there that I think real world is not going to turn out to be anything anytime soon. Yeah, so, I think you're yeah. right. Uh, let me ask you both as 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 portrait photographers, how do you feel about 50 millimeters on a full frame? Is Do you like that? Do you like wider, narrower? What do you like? Tanya, we'll start with you. I use a 50 all the time, um, mainly in newborn photography. I mean, that's my, I don't take it off for a newborn. Um, and sometimes in portraiture, it just depends. I get in kind of a, like a groove with the 50 where I want to use it often. And then I really love my 85. And so then I just forget it and I don't touch it for a while. But when I do use it, I, I think like, oh, I've neglected you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I, David Carr, do you, what yeah. do you like for portraits and headshots? Well, I just did a session a few weeks ago with uh, a, a senior um, girl and and I did most of it with a 70 to 200. Uh, you know, so I was pretty, I was far pretty back zooming in and I, there, there's a compression thing that happens there that's really elegant mm -hmm. and really, really beautiful. Um, so a lot of times, you know, with, with females, you, that's what you're going for. You want this elegant and beautiful image but there's a thing you can get with that 50 millimeter. It does distort slightly, um, mm -hmm. yeah. but there's an effect that that can give you, especially with the, if you shoot at 1.8 or 1.4 or 1.2, whatever the, the, the widest aperture is, there's an effect that you get with that. That's a good compromise. You don't get the compression, but you get this ethereal kind of otherworldly effect to it that can look really beautiful in its own way. I just don't want to do an entire portrait session with a 50. I feel like I need a slightly longer focal length to get it. 85 is good. Tom, Tanya mentioned 85. I think, uh, I, I just think, especially with a solo portrait of one person, you, you need to change it up a little, I think. It is hard to beat the 70 to 200. It really is. Yeah, it's nice. Fantastic I, I, I like, you know, I don't do a ton of portraitures, but I love, I have an 85. I have the affordable Sony 85 and yeah. I'm very happy with that. Um, I like to go a little longer. Sometimes I reviewed the 135 from Sigma years ago and I shot a bunch of portraits of that. Yeah, and that great. was really nice as well. Um, but 50, you know, every time I put a 35 or 50 on and I walk around with it, um, although the 50 can be a little tight sometimes for just general photography, I like it. Yeah, it's nice. that's nice. Well, I but, like being limited too. I like knowing that I can't zoom. I have to zoom with my feet. And yeah, um, yeah. sometimes yeah. when you limit yourself, you you do some of your best work. Yeah, so. that's actually what I use with my students at the school when I'm doing photography. Oh because yeah, because I want them to have to learn to get close to things, and it's just it's a good lens. I use it for self portraits a lot too. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Um, Pam Case is asking, she's going to Mongolia in July for Eagle and flight shots, mm -hmm. how long the lens is needed. Uh, the 100 to 400 would be nice. I mean, we get in, you get in close. Um, you have sessions with the Eagle hunters, so you don't have to have quite that long, but, but that's nice. 100 to 400 or the 150 to 600 as well. Those are good. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk just a little bit. Again, I, I mentioned this last week. I don't want to talk a whole lot about it because I don't completely understand it. But this idea of non-fungible tokens, this idea and this person, Beeple, who sold the 69 million piece of art, it is, it may be, I wasn't clear about this. I don't think I was actually. This is a digital piece of art that has been sold, not digital and then printed the person who bought this did not buy a physical thing that they can hang on a wall. They could choose to print it if they want, but that's not what they bought. They bought the digital item. Uh, 
And through this idea of these non-fungible tokens, isn't that fun to say? <laughs> um, it basically means that you can um, use a unique identifier to tie to a single digital item. The other example that I think has helped me understand this a little bit, where these are really being popular is with Top Shot's um, basketball highlight clips. Mm. People are selling, just like baseball trading cards, people are selling highlight basketball highlight clips. You can buy a pack of them. Again, you're not getting a physical bit of video. You are getting a digital video that um, you can then resell. And you are the only person or there is a limited number. Again, like baseball cards, right? There's a limited number of Hank Aaron sure. baseball cards out there. So the same idea with these digital clips. And, and you could people could be like, wait, can't you just reproduce the digital? Uh, you're not supposed to be able to. Uh, I mean, sure, there's always kind of some kind of workarounds. But I just I'm just curious about this david carr working in the art world a bit and 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 the gallery work you do how often do you see exclusivity playing into um you know sales and is, is that a thing uh yeah it's a big thing especially yeah. among, amongst art buyers people who have the money to go easily drop five six thousand dollars or more on on a painting um we sell a lot of what are called g clays um and it, it's it's the it's a reproduction of the original Mm -hmm. And it usually sells for far less, but it's they can still be in the three and four thousand dollar range, or mm -hmm. even more sometimes for a, for a copy. But those copies will say, um, you know, one of fifty or number twenty nine of fifty, and you always want to the lower number you can get, the better. So if somebody buys the first of fifty, that means there's only fifty gonna, that are going to be made like that in that size or in that format, and so you get to be one of the people that bought it at whatever that price is, and hopefully the stock in that artist goes up over time and now you've got one of the limited editions now if you get the original the the actual oil on canvas or whatever then of course you've you know that's the pinnacle and but that's usually comes at a much higher price tag and so the more i've been thinking about that and the demand for that in the art buying community the, the more i'm understanding this uh because at first it's like why would anybody want to buy some some you know ones and zeros basically is what it comes down to um, but okay. Yes. A big gallery painting. That's, that's hard to reproduce. Um, but getting a print of it's not really hard to reproduce. Mm -hmm. Um, a baseball card, when you buy a, a, an expensive, you know, baseball card, you're not buying a piece of cardboard. You're buying what it, it's almost like what it represents. It represents something rare yeah. and a value. It's well said. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, I think buying this digital copy of something, you know, in the music world, uh, artists will often sell their catalog at some point after after so many years or a certain amount of time. Somebody goes and buys the Michael Jackson catalog. It's usually a company or maybe some other really wealthy person. They buy that catalog. So now they own the copyrights to those songs. And every time that song gets used, that person makes money off of it. So there's value in owning. It doesn't mean they bought a bunch of CDs or tapes or something it's they bought the rights to that music which is all kind of in the cloud or it's it's just out there so i guess i'm starting to think of it more in those terms that like certain things could carry some real value if you were like i literally own the copyright to this shot of lebron james or this basketball player or that but whatever i literally own that or i own one of 10 of those mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, I, I I think it's an interesting idea. It opens up some possibilities for digital photographers selling their work. It's also interesting because um, I have some stuff on stock, a couple different stock websites, as sure. I've talked about from time to time. I got an email this week from Getty through 500 picks. There is an image that somebody's interested in buying, but also wants exclusivity rights to it for one, two or three years. And there is the list price of how much. And it was a couple of thousand for up to three years that they'll pay for me to basically take it down from every place else. Hmm. Um, and and, you know, for me, um, that this is not an image that sells. So, yeah, sure. You want to pay me that much for a Seriously, couple of years yeah. exclusivity? Sure. I, and, and it was it's a preliminary. I think they've reached out to a couple of different people, a couple of different images, the way it was worded. So this is not a done deal at all. But I was like, yeah, yeah sure. I, cool. I'll agree to these terms. So it's just an interesting idea uh, that I just kind of wanted to bring up a little bit more. I don't know, Tanya, you have any? Does it sound like something you'd be interested in? Well, I feel like this is something where 
we need to be interested in it. <laughs> like, yeah. I actually, one of my favorite uh, self-portrait photographers, she just sold uh, an NFT for $8,000 in an auction yesterday. Wow. And I'm no like, way. what? Gosh. You need to be doing this. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But I also, I mean, of course, huge. She has a huge established following and she represents for like Hasselblad. And so she already has that, the momentum there. Mm -hmm. um, but this is definitely a, a thing. And I feel like it's weird. Like I don't quite grasp it. I mean, I'm, it's yeah. like a digital trading card, mm -hmm. mm. you know? And I just feel like you don't, for me, I feel like I you know, don't really have it. <laughs> So I would, I don't know. It's. it's yeah. And, well, you know, I, I think it's interesting. You, you bring up the point of your friend that, and, and you made the point to say that they have this following already. You know, that's, that's one of those things. The people yeah. that sell a lot of work are people that have a name and, and have a presence in that world already. And so for me to be like, Hey, yeah, I'm getting into the NFTs. I think it's going to be just as quiet as my stock <laughs> photography is as well, because that's, that's not, I'm not known for that. So, and I think that's, but it, it is something to keep an eye on. It does seem to be real. Um, like Bitcoin, I think it's a here to stay and it's an interesting yeah. idea. Well, I think it's just anything that has value to it, whether it's a dollar value or some other, it, maybe it, there isn't a dollar amount on it, but it does have value and some sense of rarity to it or scarcity, e even on the smallest scale. If there's a way to monetize that, you know, I think in the digital age, that's what that's where we're headed with a lot of things. So yeah. Yeah. It's a weird pivot, really, because we kind of went from we owned everything we purchased and then we purchased things that we didn't really own. Like everything is in the cloud and we don't print images mm -hmm. and we just stream things like we used to ha say, like, oh, I have that movie. Like I bought that yeah. on DVD and now we just stream it. Or even if we have like a digital copy, we, we don't actually own it. So mm -hmm. this is almost a way of like. I just feel like this is like now you can fake own it. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I know what you mean. Like yeah. you just, now you just feel like you own it, and I realize there is some, you know, verification mm -hmm. involved. But I also kind of feel like well, we just found a way to make ourselves feel good about the fact that we don't have anything tangible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's very very interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. Real quick. Uh, Jamie Morgan wants to, what's, what was that word you used David to, to oh. the reproductions? Oh yeah. That? I just, I was going to answer her question. Yeah. G clay. She says, how do you make a G clay yeah. of a piece of your, yeah. You're um, talking about artwork in the gallery, not necessarily photography. Is that correct? Right. Well, I've got some G clay, uh, prints of my, well, and they call them G clay, but like when I've printed on canvas, like one of my photos, they're like, Oh, do you want a G clay of that? And I, I don't really, I think that term gets used kind of loosely, but I've under, I've come to understand it as meaning sort of the, the printed copy that, and a lot of times with the, with the paintings, for instance, you, you can't tell from a few feet away. You're like, that's the painting because it's printed on canvas. And it, a lot of times the artist goes back and embellishes it, puts a few brush strokes over the print. And so that's what we typically call a G clay. As far as making one of your work. I mean, I think if you print a, I mean, cause a photograph, a photograph, it only exists in digital or, or in print, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's, you didn't paint it. it. It's, so I don't know that you really make a G clay. You just make more copies of it. Um, mm -hmm. But you could say, I've got this photograph I'm really excited about, and I'm only going to print 10 of them mm -hmm. in this size. And, you know, you could drive up the scarcity if it's something that really, yeah. if people place value on it. Yep. Yep. I think that's an interesting idea. Okay. Um, all right. We're going to start to wrap up and uh, I want to just, so this drone, uh, my review is done, um, but I've just been flying it every day because it's just fun. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's really my, my excuse has been, oh, I need this little bit of footage or I need that little bit of footage. And I realized yesterday at a spot that I was at that this huge athletic field complex was all locked up. And I could put the drone down on the field and fly it around uh, for some neat shots. And I wouldn't have to worry about it. no one was down there. It was all locked up. And so as I was flying it around, then I was like, oh, I'll get some additional footage for the goggles. Because there's no easy way to show you all what you see through the goggles because there's a bunch of information overlays. And DJI hasn't provided a way to share that out yet. So I've been doing really low tech ways of like putting a camera up to the goggles or putting the GoPro up to the goggles. So what you're about to see 
is me um, flying this drone from one side of a football field slash soccer field to the other side very, very fast and right into the soccer net. You say, well, that sounds pretty stupid, Toby. How did you do that? Well, I had the GoPro up to the goggles, so I couldn't really see what I was doing. I didn't realize just how fast it went that quickly, despite the fact that I've been flying it for about three weeks now. Um, <laughs> and I didn't realize just how close I was actually to that other end of the, to the soccer field. Mm. Um, I can't show you footage from the drone itself because it hit the net so hard that it disconnected the battery and that corrupted the last two and a half seconds of the footage. And that's enough to go from the 50 yard line to the soccer field, which was in the end zone or right next to it. The speed, and that was just in sport mode. That isn't even in manual mode. The speed at which this thing is capable of flying is just makes it so much fun to zoom around. So I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, minimize this and hope I didn't have anything dumb behind it. What do I have behind it? Oh, there's the video. And then here is the GoPro footage right here. And I hope that's, is that showing up right? Where's my stream yard? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sorry that again, it's kind of small, um, but here we go. And now I'm going to, oh, teasing you. Uh, I notice very hopefully that the whole top of the goggle view is yellow and red warning me that I'm about to hit something. Now in the review there, you can see right away, it's, it's already yellow and red in the review. I kind of complain that it's like overzealous about warning. Like there are times <laughs> where I feel like I'm far <laughs> away from stuff and it's warning me. And so I've started to ignore it a little bit but I'm also realizing that it's kind of projecting based on the direction you're going. And, you know, I know I'm going to pull up or go off this way. And in this case, I'm just flying across the field. So <laughs> here we go. Um, there it is. Very, very exciting stuff. And it hit the net so hard that it just stopped and got caught in the rope right there. Oh, no. Right there. I just, I'm just going to make you feel better by saying all of my drone footage, if I flew a drone, would end up like this. <laughs> I tell you, though, they're, they're, they, you know, if you're not an idiot and you're not Tanya, I'm not saying that uh, it, they are pretty hard to crash. They yeah. really have a lot of kind of helpful features that keep you from crashing. If I had still been in normal mode, it would have forced me to slow so far down that I would eventually have been like, oh, I'm about to run into this. Yeah. Um, the only so, time I ever crashed mine was in sport mode. So sport mode. Yeah. Um, and let's see. I have a flight from earlier where I crashed. No. Nope. Oh, wrong one. I, um, well, I was just going to say this. So it's it's locked up in the middle of this field with a fairly tall fence around the whole thing. And I was like, well, I could scale it, but there's a lot of people around. I don't want to get yelled at. So I noticed that there's some kids in football uniforms starting to show up. And I looked at my watch and I was like, oh, it's like 15 minutes to four. I bet practice starts at four. So I just kind of hung out on the outskirts. And then a guy showed up and they're all like, hey, coach. And so I went over and I was like, hey, sir, this is really embarrassing. But um <laughs> Uh, my drone's down there on the field, crashed. And he's like, what? Oh, all right, no worries. And he was really cool. <laughs> okay, good. And he actually went down. He got it out of the net for me. I saw it took him like, you know, 15, 20 seconds to untangle the net around the, the propeller. And um, then he was uh, he was good. Um, so it's it pretty funny. Let's see. Is this the one where? I would say from working at a school, it was a good call that you did not break into the school grounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought I thought people could be upset about that. Okay, here's another um, flight a little bit earlier where I took this corner a little too. No, that wasn't that one. Shoot. I have one other where I dinged it into the. Oh, right here, right here. Uh -oh. A little, a little fence ding. But still, even with all of that. Let's uh, turn that screen sharing off. Um, oh, look, we're Brady Bunch. Even with all of that, it's totally fine. Propellers are fine. Drone is fine. Um, That's I, great. I, my neighbor, I let my neighbor kid fly it for a few minutes today, um, and uh, it's fine. So I, I'm Good. impressed. Uh, ultimately, I'll spoil the review for everybody who, you know, I appreciate you watching and commenting. Um, go ahead and watch the, the review when it's released. But I'm not going to be buying this anytime soon because the style of footage doesn't really suit 
usually what I want to capture. But I really wish I had an excuse to buy it because it's just fun. It seems like it. <laughs> so that's what I'll say about that. Well, I think uh, I think that's it. I think we're done. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Tanya and David, thank you so much. If you're still watching the show, please give it a thumbs up, but also take a moment to follow uh, these two guest hosts today along with me. I really appreciate their time and energy that they've given to this show. You can find Tanya, of course, at tanyawilhelm.artist. And from there, you can go see her amazing macro work and her portraiture work. And of course, watch her stories as she restores um, a bunch of furniture. And we'll see you. I know you shared some of that kind of uh, style of work that you're working on, a refrigerator is involved. I'll just tease that and say I'm excited to uh, to see you when you can start creating that again. I'm excited too. It's coming. Good. Awesome. That's cool. And David Carr, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Everybody go follow David. Always. Is it David Carr underscore photo, yeah. who will be probably sharing some cool stuff from Africa soon. Yes. Yeah. I can't wait to see what you guys come back with. Yeah. Yeah. I'm me neither. About that. All right. And Roy, thanks so much for hanging out and chat and uh, keeping us all squared away. Appreciate that. And everybody watching uh, right now. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again. There'll be a couple, uh, two weeks break, I believe, before we're back yeah, uh, from so. travels for the show. So everybody, thanks so much. Great. Have a wonderful Wednesday. Bye-bye.